Camera B rolling. Camera A rolling. Cine, take one. Hello and good afternoon. Who are you and what does your brand represent? I am Chef Charlie Ray and my brand represents nature and bleh. I am Chef Charlie Ray and I represent nature, naturalism, and going along with the seasons. Just to be safe, let's also try, can you introduce yourself? Okay. Tell us a bit about you. Okay. Um, uh, hi, I am Chef Charlie Ray. I am a Swedish Black American wild foraging chef whose ideals are aligned with kind of Mother Earth. What the seasons bring is what the harvest brings, and we just feed our bodies and medicate our bodies through nature. Okay. Um, can you tell us about? your role in food activism. Why don't you go back? To the first question? No, to the beginning, like her story with her grandparents. Okay, yeah. okay, that was the Both next question, actually, up. yeah. Okay, so yeah. in that case. Take her on a journey. Where did it all start? Tell us about your childhood. I grew up foraging for mushrooms with my grandparents in Sweden. We lived in the woods and every harvest season we would go out into the woods to gather chanterelle mushrooms and wild strawberries and raspberries and blackberries and blueberries and lingonberries grow all over our forest naturally and then we'd also like go out to the water and go fishing for mackerel but they'd always go out for eight hours a day so I got exhausted by that uh, but we would always bring it back my grandmother would always clean them and then we'd always put our berries on these like straw strings and just eat them while we were out foraging so that really like got me closer to nature. Um, so yeah, just my, the way my grandparents raised me was to be close with nature. Okay, so um, I don't know if this is jump too far ahead, but um, tell me about food activism and your role in it and define it also. So what really got me into aggressively pushed into activism through food is when I was living in Iceland, I went dumpster diving to help feed refugees and um, just p people that were in need. And they weren't dumpsters that we were going into. We ended up going to like whole warehouses full of food that people were throwing away. And it was heartbreaking to know that people are starving at the same time. So that really put me on a journey to figure out how to combat food waste or how to use food waste in a way that's beneficial. And the most active way that we can do that is by eating locally and eating seasonally because that minimizes and eliminates food waste as a whole and nourishes our bodies. Okay, and where were you when, uh, when uh, the uh, dumpster diving started? Um, I said it already. I Iceland. Iceland. But I did say it. I did say it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, go back to the this. journey part. Okay. So go back to, like, how did you go from being a kid foraging with your grandparents to becoming a chef or being interested in food and... You have to answer that question? No. Um, <clears throat> so when I was younger, I would have these highs and lows in my... Per I'm like, it's fine. Uh, so when I was younger, I would have these highs and lows in my personality. I'd be like, super happy kid and then aggressively depressed and sad. Sorry, we want you to sit right next to the camera. Yeah. Um, I would have these highs and lows and it turns out that I was hypoglycemic. So I just had to eat to regulate my mood. What is hypoglycemia? Um, Wait, let her keep going. I'm sorry, um, okay, go for it. Uh, so when so I maybe, was, so can you start over? Yeah. yeah. When I was younger, I would have these highs and lows of my personality. Pretty much every time I got hungry, I'd get angry. And as a child, that would just mean crying or shutting down. And it turns out I was like hypoglycemic, which is kind of a form of diabetes, but instead of insulin, you just need sugar. Um, and so I just kind of had to eat. So I'd eat constantly and I would get palate fatigue, which is I'd get bored of certain flavors very quickly. So I started to learn how to cook and feed myself and feed my friends at around the age of 10. And then it just kind of, I say the chef life chose me, I didn't choose it. Uh, and I just had to keep feeding myself and feeding my friends and it just became a habit that I made into a career. Okay. So <clears throat> take us through your career history. Uh, where were you and what were you doing for work? Um, 
God, I'm gonna, this this question is not relevant as I wanted it to be. Um, take us through your career, uh, relevant career history. Um, as a traveling foraging chef, the reason I was able to do that is I just worked as a chef in multiple countries. I have dual citizenship, so I moved to New Orleans because I heard that there was good food there. Uh, I was 19 and not legal to drink, but in the industry, it doesn't matter. Um, so I was just a chef on Bourbon Street there. I went up to Alaska and spent a whole summer just feeding people that I was staying with and fishing along like the coast and the rivers all over Alaska. I moved to Iceland and worked at a Michelin restaurant there and went dumpster diving and quit the Michelin restaurant uh, to help feed refugees. And I did my degree in gastronomy in northern Sweden in the Arctic Circle, which really like got me really close to the wild foods of like elk and moose and deer and bear and all those fun things that we eat in Sweden. And then I eventually ended up moving to Australia where I worked with indigenous and um, where I worked with Aboriginal chefs to kind of get close to the land and help bring their food into like more open spaces. Like, uh, and then there's other chefs that of course do that there as well. So I was able to work alongside a lot of Aboriginal chefs that taught me a lot about that flora and fauna there. And then I decided to move back to California and just Bring the knowledge of the world with me here and teach others here how to be like that. Okay. I would unpack some of that a little bit. Yeah. So maybe have her talk about, you know, tell us the year you started at, at the Michelin restaurant, what was it called? Okay. You know, what was that like? So do that part. Okay. Then do the Sweden Arctic Circle part and then do the Aboriginal part. Gotcha. You. They were meshed, but yeah. Yeah. So. No, it's a, yeah, it, what you did was great. It's just the audience is going to want to know more. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can't just be like, <laughs> it's crazy. Everything you said is so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need details. <laughs> but you said it was like a three minute documentary. So. Three to eight minutes. Okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so when I was doing my degree in gastronomy in the mm -hmm. Arctic Circle in Umeå, Sweden, I, in our final years, we sign up for an internship or something on site. And as a traveler, I'm like, well, I'm not staying in this country. And I decided to hop on over to Iceland and do it at a Michelin restaurant called Dill there. And it was great because we would forage for the menu each week. We would go uh, wait for low tide, wait out into the water, and like pick these like little types of kelp that grew only under like complete like submersion of water that went out in low tide. And they were called like sea truffles. And then we had like horsetail kelp, which is like these big, thick black uh, like. Uh, brown ones and but when you cook them they turn bright green and then you we dehydrate them and like puff fry them it was cool it was a lot of fun but then I ended up meeting the anarchist kitchen and became the head chef of the anarchist kitchen which is where I ended up dumpster diving help feed refugees and like families that were put out and then we would make three course meals for them and then anything that was left over they got to take home to feed their families would you mind defining uh, anarchist kitchen uh, and Atkins Kitchen is uh, completely independently run against the government wishes. <laughs> uh, so dumpster diving is illegal. Um, feeding people without paying taxes is illegal, which is ridiculous because that means that humans are illegal and we're not. In Sweden, we actually do have this law called Almansrätt, and it means all man's right. And it's all man's right to feed and house themselves. So anywhere in Sweden that you go, you can pick wild berries and food and fish, and you can camp but it cannot be for more than 24 hours, and um, it cannot be on private property. Same with the picking. So that's all allowed in our culture, in our country. And it's just seeing the aggressive pushback against people allow, being allowed to do that in other countries is really sad. Gotcha. Um, so that was Iceland in the Arctic Circle, and then it was Australia next? Uh, <clears throat> after completing my degree in Umeå, Sweden, uh, which was a lot of fun, like I said, it was Arctic Circle, so we ate a lot of reindeer. I went snowboarding one time, there's reindeer on my path, and I'm like, all right, I guess I'm stuck behind these people. They're dumb, by the way. Um, they travel in hordes of hundreds, and they just, you can push them. They're like, mm, they don't care. Uh, and then I decided to move to Australia, because I didn't want to move back to America, because somebody was president. Um, so I decided to go somewhere that was hot, not like Sweden, and not America. So I was like, okay. Australia. I'd never been there, but I decided to move there. So I got there and I just started like engrossing myself in the culture, which is like heavily Asian influence, which means the food is amazing. You use indigenous ingredients with Asian influence, uh, delicious. Um, and then I ended up meeting uh, Chef Angus, who is from the Rajri mob there. 
uh, was he Wiradjuri or Wondry, and I'm sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly because it's one of the two. And became close with him and then his brothers and cousins. And um, they taught me a lot about how Aboriginals cook and eat and which native land and what it means to be that. What kind of things do they cook and, and eat? Kangaroo, crocodile, wallaby, uh, had emu steak, ostrich, um, sea snails, uh, oysters, so many oysters. I love the oysters. The oysters and the, everything that, like, I mean, I love, I love oysters. Like, <laughs> I love them. Um, it was just, uh, what is it? Mm, what's that called? My favorite spice out there. And I'm blanking on it. Waddle seed. There we go. Of course. Uh, Waddle seed. And we also like learned how to use wattle seed, which is like you like is the toasted seed, mm -hmm. and it tastes like a mix between coffee and chocolate. But you put that on steak, and it's perfect. Put that on emu steak, it's even cooler. Yeah. And um, samphire, which is like this seed salad thing, um, it's just it was really cool just being out there and just like tasting all the indigenous stuff and like working closely with the native people. That's cool. Was it Australia with um, <clears throat> with the farm, with the seafood farm? Yes. Tell, tell us about that. Um, <clears throat> during lockdown, I ended up uh, like kind of like moving cities. And when I was like kind of passing through one of the cities, I ended up eating at this place called the Muscle Cafe. And I thought it was a really cool concept and the muscles were some of the best I've ever had. So I was talking to the owners and I was like, hey, I'm a chef, you know, like I, I love your food. This is amazing. So like, oh, we'll just come on, come on with us out on the boat tomorrow morning and harvest some mussels. So I'm like, of course. Uh, so I ended up going like four or five o'clock in the morning, hopped on the boat and just spent the whole day harvesting mussels in this mussel farm in the bay in Melbourne, Australia. And um, that's when I discovered like the native species of uh, sea stars, which are these ones, the Lenormand sea star. So this became my Australian tattoo. Okay. And then uh, I ended up becoming uh, the chef there that helped them like expand their menu and <clears> become like closer and more updated because it's a bit rural, so they have like no vegan options or like anything like that. Okay. So just help them expand their menu after that. Got you. And um, you had mentioned uh, something about how um, the muscle farm. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I actually loved. One of the reasons I loved working on the Muscle Farm is because of how they actually helped the environment. So it was a government grant to help start Muscle Farms, and they save all the shells that like people eat on, like in the restaurant, and they send them back to like this um, ocean conservatory, and they would like wash them and then implant them back into the bay, and they would break down into natural minimal minerals that would help build up the actual reef systems in those areas, and because you're growing mussels, which are bio -bile filtration systems that actually helps clean the water in the area for more indigenous animals to come back into the seas. Perfect. Okay, and then um, after Australia? Uh, I'm back here. <laughs> uh, once I was in Australia for a couple years and like, you know, COVID was over and certainly somebody wasn't president anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. decided to move back to America, and this is when I started working closely with local farms in Southern California. One being Stone Soup Farm, where I'm the executive chef and do uh, native pop-ups, all open fire food, and we just kind of go seasonally, and whatever's growing on the farm is what you, that's what we serve, and then by local farms, or like local hunters for the proteins. And now I am an executive chef consultant, opening up the first women's sports bar in California, fifth in the country and just helping other restaurants uh, develop more sustainable practices and expand. Wait, is it stone soup? Mm -hmm. Like the story? Uh, okay, <coughs> maybe, so you, so you work at stone soup? Yeah, or? that's my farm. That's your farm? Well, I'm the executive chef there. Okay, so maybe just to have the sound bite, just start with, um, I'm the executive chef at Stone Soup Farm, mm -hmm. and then finish the song. Like, expand on what Stone Soup Farm is. Uh, I'm the executive chef at Stone Soup Farm where we host events all throughout the season and we serve whatever is growing in our garden at the time. It is an apple orchard, so heavy focus on apple season. And uh, so we do apple picking, apple pressing, and um, we have this like, I don't want to say huge, this is a very small, small farm, but we host pop-up events and just grow things seasonally. What kind of things? Um, in different seasons besides apples. Yeah, um, I think last year our summer squashes were like this big, 
and we have a, like seven different types of tomatoes from like these big plump ones that get like this big to these tiny black ones that taste more like a tomato than anything else you've ever tasted uh, to pumpkins and we have lots of like nasturtium and radishes and we're going through the menu today for our upcoming events actually so she's going to start a planting season for the fall mm -hmm. and um, tell me what's in season now for our April event coming up and lavender lots of lavender Okay. Um, what kind of things have you foraged for in other parts of the world? Oh. Well, I guess I'd have to translate them. <laughs> I can't. That's fine. We have to translate the, the whole. Um, hmm. So the only place I forage for mushrooms is in Sweden, because that's where I grew up doing it. It is one of the most dangerous forms of foraging, because if you don't know what you're doing with mushrooms, you will kill yourself or someone else if you feed them. Uh, so that's... I do not encourage that. But uh, if you do or are interested in foraging, go to somebody who does know and stick with green things. Because um, if you get sick, you get sick, but at least you won't die. In Sweden, we the the, the basic one is chanterelle mushrooms, which is these guys, and the ones that we grew up foraging with my grandparents, and then berries, um, raspberries, blackberries, wild strawberries, and then in Australia, there's a lot of blackberries growing everywhere. Um, and then in California, Northern California, we have salmon berries, which are like blackberries or raspberries, but they grow tall over your head and they're orange. And then salmon. around here is lots of sage. So we have black sage, we have pineapple sage, we have sagebrush, which is also a nat natural antimicrobial. Um, so if you ever get cut in nature, it's good to identify that one. You can eat it and you can heal your wounds with it. What can you make with it? Sage things. Um, I mean, it's the flavor of sage. So, like, okay. if you like sage, you can you can cook anything with you. if you fish. Okay. You know. <laughs> okay. Um, how can foraging be helpful to us in our planet? So, foraging can be helpful in multiple ways. One ways is by n nourishing our bodies through like the seasonal growth of the local area that we're in. But another way is, for example, um, mustard and broccoli are related. Um, yes, <laughs> there. Uh, but here in California, the Europeans brought over different types of mustard seed, so black mustard and Mediterranean mustard, which grow all over Southern California. The yellow flowers that you see on the side of the road, they're aggressively invasive. So it's kind of like eat it to death, please, um, because they take over before the native plants have a time to, and then they die out before our seasons, and then the fires come, and then that's what burns everything. So foraging could help nourish you and also save California from fire season, for example. But black mustard tastes like, um, black mustard tastes like a ho raw horseradish, so it's pretty intense. And then Mediterranean mustard tastes like broccoli. So they're like little flowers and they taste like these like vastly different things. Interesting, but they're, they're like the same. They look, yeah, yeah, yeah. But black mustard would be like up here in like a big bushel that's like this big and it's like yellow flowers and then Mediterranean mustard would be down here and it's like this big, but it tastes like broccoli. Um, do you plan to continue your fight for the world to be more uh, sustainable, sustainable and less wasteful? That's a yes, no. Oh. So. Okay. How? Yeah, what's your vision or, yeah. How do you plan to continue? Do you want to, like, remind me of that thing I said the other day? You said, like, that was a... Uh, you know what, I don't even have it, actually. It's on our text messages. Because that was a good one. And it kind of ties back to the Anarchist Kitchen. To the what? The Anarchist Kitchen in Iceland. Just like... Anarchist. I've heard of Dill. Yeah. Um, the original chefs of Dill went over to start... Well, some of the chefs from Noma went over to start Dill, and some of the chefs from Dill went, and Noma went over to start Aquabeak in New York. So, like, they're all connected. It's crazy. It's, like, next. It's funny because like my head chef at Dill was his name was Ragnar. Like Viking. Um, Crazy respect to like go from that to Anarchist Kitchen. Like it's I, yeah, I just, the culture of like doing fine dining just doesn't sit right with me because it's like taking something that should be natural and then putting a price tag on it. Um, while at the same time stepping over people. That's the that's that's what I was looking yeah. for right there. Um, that's literally the yeah, the sound bite. I went from working fine dining to working at the Anarchist Kitchen, for example, because 
I feel like taking something that should be so natural, like foraging and feeding yourself off the land, putting a price tag on it and then selling it back to people while stepping over those who are starving is absolutely ridiculous. And then also just taking half of that and making sure that it doesn't go to those less fortunate. So I want to combat that. And then whenever I said that other time, you said that's the sound bite. That's what yeah. I want to know what I said. Um, I believe you said that you wanted to it was something about like the act of rebellion. Yeah, yeah, you wanted to teach people how to uh, feed and medicine themselves without use of the government or big pharma. Yeah. Um, how do I tie that to what I just said? <laughs> um, how do you plan on uh, continuing your fight for the world to be more sustainable? Could maybe start with like my experience with the chef or whatever, or the these experiences. Member taught you that and brought you here. Um, <clears throat> but my experience with like everything from the anarchist kitchen to growing up foraging in the wild to going aggressively seasonal has taught me to help other people learn how to medicate and nourish themselves through food, uh, through foraging and food. And it's kind of like the ultimate act of rebellion against the government is learning how to like medicate yourself outside of big pharma and how to feed yourself outside of big agriculture. And that's a right that we have as humans and it's ridiculous that it's been taken away from us. All right. Well, do you hear that sound? Should you do that again? Remind me what I said if I have to. <laughs> 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 yeah, maybe try to do it again. It was pretty loud. So my experience. OK. Yeah. And <laughs> you did it really well. I don't yeah. have a short term memory. <laughs> um, remember yeah. when you did it? Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Anarchist kitchen, government, big pharma, fuck them all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my experience working at the anarchist kitchen to growing up foraging and feeding ourselves through nature has taught me and uh, like, mm. Mm. no worries. It's okay. Okay. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. I know. I'm just trying to remember what I said at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Feed people and medicine people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Working from everywhere, from the anarchist kitchen in Iceland to learning how to pick and forage off the land in Australia and growing up doing that in Sweden has made me want to teach other people how to create less waste by living off the land and also being able to medicate themselves and feed themselves, which is really the ultimate act of rebellion against the government that has taken our rights away from us as, like, if I just use me as an example, so female, POC, foreign born, queer, they've taken away all of our rights. And I think that we should take them all back aggressively. Right, get, a, get in where you can, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, God, it's a yes or no question. Uh, tell us about, um, teaching others and teaching other restaurants this ideology. Um. And also your new restaurants. I have noticed a trend over the course of my lifetime, that we are extremely disconnected from our food system. Like, you know, I show somebody like a picture of a pig and then feed them pork and they're like, I don't wanna see the animal. So we're extremely disconnected, which means we don't have any respect for our food system. So we don't see it as a life being lost and then being thrown away when you waste food. You just see it as, I bought this, I can throw it away. So I wanna close that loop through teaching people about how to eat food properly and how to waste less in general. And so that is my job as an executive chef consultant and as a traveling wild chef is to teach others how to really take care of Mother Earth so we can take care of our own bodies and vice versa and make it all one big nice little circle again. Close loop. Okay. My calling, if you will. There you go. Um, I feel like I already asked this, but what are you doing now and are you still actively fighting the green fight? Um, right now I am consulting, right now I'm consulting with other chefs and I'm also doing private dinners on the farm and I'm just kind of working with local farms and other food activists situations. No, nope, that's the wrong word. Food activists, projects, there we go. Um, I'm an executive chef consultant working with restaurants to help them become more circular and more seasonal while also teaching people 
like local native foraging and how to forage like invasive species for food and for medicine. And then also working with other activist uh, food projects like the Big Queer Food Festival with uh, Food Network and then just trying to get more eyes on the ideology of feeding yourself and medicating yourself from the land. Okay. Um, you mentioned Food Network. Tell us about your uh, experiences on the uh, shows. So I'm known as, well I'm known as a few things. Uh, I'm known as the Food Encyclopedia and the Wild Chef. So I, I do know a lot. Now I don't want to talk about that because that makes me seem like I'm bolstering. No, no, no. That's what we're here for. No, I'm that's, not. That's what we're here I'm for. not LA like that. <laughs> that's how LA people talk. I just teach people. I just know everything to it, but like, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm known as like the Danger Chef, the Wild Chef. I've competed on multiple different cooking shows, including Amazon Prime. Can you name the shows? I can name the ones that are out. Yeah. Um, I compete on Battle of the Decades on Food Network, which is episode three. And I got top three in the world from Amazon Prime's, Amazon Prime UK's version. Uh, mm -mm, let me just read you all that. Mm -hmm. Blah, can't use it. Tell us about the, the first one that you, that you were like, going a little death about, what the uh, competition was about and everything. So I competed on Amazon Prime's The World Cook, season mm -hmm. one. I got top three in the world. So we were 16 chefs from 16 different countries that went head to head with our cultural cuisine. I represented Sweden. And we filmed each episode in a different country, which is very anti-climate. Um, but I was known as the wild chef. So they would, I would take everything from nature and forage and I'd put it on the menu. And it got me pretty far, so. <laughs> and I've also been on some Food Network shows. Uh, Battle of the Decades is one of them. It was a lot of fun. I'm still really close friends with the chefs I met there. And then an upcoming one that is out is 24 and 24, where 24 chefs compete for 24 hours straight. Um, we all have PTSD from that show. <laughs> and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> and then I have quite a few more shows coming out, but they're not out yet, so I can't talk about it. Gotcha. Um, what legacy do you want to leave behind? Mm. The legacy that I would like to leave behind is just be rebellious. Like, nothing matters besides like your body, your nourishment, your loved ones, the planet. Things that nourish you, nourish them back and take care of them. And that is including our planet and it's not our government or anyone's government or the government. I'm not an anarchist. Well, you kind of are. <laughs> <laughs> Like part time when you work in the kitchen here, that's when you're an anarchist. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm kind of circling back around. Mm -hmm. um, so we have an idea of what people in need are here. Obviously, in LA, we see them all the time. What are they like overseas in other parts of the world, and how did you feel when you came across them? Can I redefine your person of people in need? Um, the people that you were uh, dumpster diving for, the uh, less the refugees. I'm sorry. Um, well, no, I'm gonna say I'm gonna redefine your definition. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, I mean. for me, helping people in need is people who uh, are in need of something that they are not, they are currently not getting. And that is our entire Westernized society when it comes to nutrition and connection to food and self. So the way I help people in need is by teaching, uh, teaching and giving. So I feed people and then I teach people how to feed themselves. So I'll like teach them how to fish kind of situation. And as a Westernized society, we're all in need of that. Mm, that's, that's pretty much all I got. I have a couple more. Please. Um, I'll, I'll, you could, can you stand over here? Yeah. Because <laughs> I will talk to you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, describe like your typical foraging adventure out here in Southern California. Um, so a typical day of a Southern California forager. Um, if I'm walking in my neighborhood, I still stuff my corpse's lawns. It's urban foraging. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so a typical day of foraging is I, well, I pick the location based off the season. So more in the mountains, like spring is absolutely like, abundant. Uh, desert is desolate, but great for mustard. And um, winter is good for like, like dandelion roots and stuff, which you actually make like a kind of coffee out of. It's really cool. Hmm. So I find the area depending on the season and then 
I just use the knowledge that I've gained through other foragers. I have Pascal Bedar, who is my kind of like Southern California foraging guru here, who has taught me a lot. And um, when I suspect something is what I think it is, I put it in my mouth, and if it's not, it tastes gross, and I spit it out. Because uh, foraging is still a dangerous act. <laughs> <laughs> what have you tried that with? I mean, I end up not knowing those things. Okay. Because I'm just like, I don't know what that is, but it's not edible. Yeah. If it tastes bitter and green, in like a bad way, then it's fine. Like think of like a piece of lettuce, right? Yeah. It tastes like water. Right. But then if you chew on a leaf from the side of a bush, it tastes like bitter green. Like the, the, the flavor that you think green is, that means not edible. So just like, you can break something and like put that piece on your tongue and if it tastes, cause you'll taste that right away and then you spit it out. But if it tastes fine, then just have a nibble and then see if you get sick. Or high. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, Google research, ask other people. <laughs> There's definitely other options. You, are you guys going foraging? Tomorrow. Or, so describe where you're going tomorrow and why, why go there now. And... Uh, so tomorrow we're going up in the hills of, I do not know the name of the area. Uh, so tomorrow we're going- Silmar. Silmar? Silmar. Silmar, thank you. So tomorrow we're going to Silmar. It's got this beautiful little like river bed that flows through with a lot of milk thistle that goes around it and uh, sagebrush, which is an antimicrobial. And then there is yucca, which is a great like nature thing to like get yourself clean. And there's just an abundance of food, like shovel and things like that around there. So I really want to be able to like showcase you guys how to kind of just walk anywhere in the hills in California and just have a little bit of a snack. And milk thistle is a great way to actually hydrate yourself and give yourself electrolytes if you ever get stuck in those types of situations. And add one more. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you go foraging, you know, finding the fruit of nature, how does that make you feel? Amazonian. Um, I don't know, okay, so like when I'm, when I'm out foraging, for lack of better terminology, it makes me feel like a witch. Uh, just because I'm like, I'm taking something that grows naturally with absolutely no human interaction and then using it to nourish my body, people around me, and kind of, and like you always have to be mindful when you're foraging. You can't ever crop clear. You're like, oh, I like this plant, let me just take all of it. You never do that. You just take what you need. And just like nature does, it takes what it needs and it, it leaves the rest to grow another day. And that's what we have to do as well. So I just feel closer to nature, one with nature, and kind of like I am a creature of this planet and vice versa. And it all kind of becomes within me so I can give it to others and then vice versa with the planet. That was cool. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. All right, remind me what I said. <laughs> You're a witch. <laughs> you told, I'm a healer. Toadstools and stuff. What do they? What do witches make? I don't know. You have a cauldron. First of all, that is the patriarchal version of. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Are you have anything else you can think of? So you think you have the all the key points that you're gonna need for the story? Um, I think so. We have a people need. Found the other There's parts. There's a lot of very good stuff. Yeah, I can so be helpful with that. So. I think for Microdoc, you're good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. All right. Yeah. Cut. Talk more time. Yeah. Yes. We also have to decide on the time. Cut. Speed. Speed. Uh, scene two, take two. Um, how do, how do uh, you have dinner at Stone Soup Farm? Uh, so on my farm or so on Stone Soup Farm, you follow our Instagram page and then you, well, we'll post events and everything like that and then you just go to the website and book through there. And we are few and far between, so once every couple months and during growing season, that's when we have like more open door events, like apple picking season. Um, I just kind of like give you like a little plate of like different apple treats, but then you can also book private events there. We do not do more than 30 people at a time, and um, it's all outdoors, so prepared for weather, no matter whether that, no matter what the weather. <laughs> and it's very beautiful and it's very peaceful and it's very all inclusive. Okay, and um, how can uh, people re reach out to you? So Chef Charlie Ray on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Well, don't say TikTok anymore, I guess. Um, so Chef Charlie Ray on everything. Oh. ChefCharlieRay.com. Nope. Yes. Not yet. Uh, ChefCharlieRay.com, ChefCharlieRay at Gmail, ChefCharlieRay on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Thank you. That's, that's all I have.
Okay. Cut. 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 Um, 